Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live stream today. Uh, Cammie and her husband are going to be joining us shortly. Well, Cammie is. Her husband is trying to help her with some audio issues currently, so I'm sorry for the late delay. Um, as we have people trickling in, I'm just going to introduce the stream and kind of what today is all about. If you didn't catch the first part of this on Cammie's channel, um, <clears throat> we are actually going to be going through uh, writing advice uh, and how some advice that author tubers, um, larger published authors, um, and just people in general are sort of touting as, um, as standards in the industry may not be the best advice going forward and kind of dissecting that. Um, for anyone watching the replay, uh, thank you so much, and we appreciate you doing that. And um, I think Cammie is ready to rejoin the stream, so I'm going to try and get her on in just a second. Hi, How everybody. Is now? <laughs> How is it? Is it okay? Um, I it's up to you. You tell me how it sounds. Sounds good now. Sounds oh, good. Does now. it? Whatever we did is working. Okay, it's working. Yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for my my free tech support. <laughs> I know. Uh, Whenever yes. she called her husband down, I was like, "Oh, our built-in IT people, our husbands, yay!" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three cheers for them! <laughs> yay, thank you. Um, so I heard you introduce yourself and the live stream. And uh, is it okay if I just quickly introduce myself? Go right ahead, my lovely co-host, everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> I'm Cami, and I give weekly uh, advice for authors, writers, wherever you are on your journey. And they're usually really short. I like 10 minute tips. That's my preference as a viewer, as well as um, making videos. I like the shorter ones. Um, and I am currently working on compiling a really efficient resource uh, for writers. So I'm going to be building tons of fun playlists on my channel so that you can search by topic of things that you're interested in and find the best ac advice across author tube like Brandon Sanderson and Jerry Jenkins and I'm collecting all kinds of fantastic advice for you guys into one easy playlist. So that's me. Hi. Yay! You can find Cami on her website or her YouTube channel in the description box down below. I have her linked. Um, also, if you didn't check out part one of this, that is uh, on her channel. So this is part two of this series that we're doing. Um, and last time we had a lot of fun, I think, with it. Um, lots of opinions were had. Yes. <laughs> Good, a few, bad. A few, a few times we disagreed. Yeah, we're allowed to disagree. We're allowed to disagree. <laughs> it's a really um, cool friends. We're so exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dallas saying hi, Cami. Hi, Dallas. <laughs> she um she was already in the chat like before we went live, saying thanking us and setting oh, a reminder, no. saying she was excited for this part. Yay. Um, Dal, you're the best. I know she's so supportive. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to be kind of continuing along the same theme of the stream last time, which is we're going to be going over um, bad writing advice. Maybe it's advice that is just um, overcomplicated or an overcorrection or too vague, or maybe it's just advice we shouldn't be taking at all, um, but definitely shouldn't be using as like standards in the writing industry because, you know, um, generalizations can be harmful, especially to newer writers. And we're kind of, you know, dissecting that one by one, not to say anyone who gives this advice is like a bad person or anything, just that maybe we need more specific advice or more helpful advice and kind of debunking the myths, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, let's see here. We have another comment. Oh, hi, Kelly. Glad to be here with y'all today. We're glad that you're here with us today. Yay, Thank you for hi, joining hi. us. So nice. Um, and if anybody has opinions or thoughts or questions or anything, please feel free to add that in the chat, you know, because we'll be monitoring that sort of as we go through the stream. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and feel free to disagree with me at any point. Yeah, me too. <laughs> that's, how, that's how we learn and grow is by learning different that's perspectives. Right. So disagreement mm -hmm. is is warranted. Um, but let's Let's jump right in with the first one because I feel like you're gonna have opinions about this that are fun. Um, so this, 
<laughs> You're expecting me to have a rant. Rant? What? <laughs> um, I never. I never. <laughs> <laughs> this okay. first piece of advice um, is always or never advice. Like you should always do something or you should never do something. Yes. Writing so, advice including always and never. This one kind of got me into hot water this week. <laughs> it did. It did. Okay. So I... I did a little bit of a clicky title. I knew it was a little controversial on one of my videos, but um, I made a lot of people mad. Oh, it really no. me because I did one on show don't tell. And my issue with that advice is not the showing or the telling. My issue is the word don't, which is all or nothing language. This is what we're talking about right now. It's yeah. always or never. And the truth is that's, that's just simply not true. I mean, I mean, this book I love so far, and he shows on the, I think it's the second page. He, I mean, that shows, he tells something. And so my point of the video was, you know, it's the all or nothing language that we need to be careful with, but it was a YouTube short. And yeah. so there was only so much time I had and people got mad at me. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. so, my thing with all or nothings is that they don't belong in creative work. They just, they yeah. just don't belong because there is no one thing that's one size fits all for every creative work. Every story is going to breathe its own life. Every piece of art, whether it's painting or music or creative writing or whatever it is, it breathes its own way. And you have to you have to get the rhythm of what that piece is and let it sort of form itself. You know? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that um, language that is... Um, exclusive like that saying always do this or never do this um mm -hmm. it's sort of it defeats the purpose because the purpose of a really great tight prose is that there's balance in the narrative which means that you're doing something some of the time and some things other parts of the time and mm -hmm. also if you think about it like Shakespeare, I use him as an example a lot, but he literally created words that we still use in the English language, but he made them up. Like no one knew what they were until he made them up and wrote them down. So he yeah. learned the rules and he broke them, but he did it in such a way that people could infer the meaning through context clues, what these words were, and they started using them in their own vernacular. And he actually like changed the English language by doing that, but he, would never have done that if it was like, you can never do this, or you yes. always have to do this. Learn mm -hmm. the rules so that you can break them intentionally, you know, have mm -hmm. balance in your narrative. You know, mm -hmm. if you say you can always do this, or, or you have to always do this, or you can never do this, then it really stifles you creatively. You know, um, some of the writers that I like the best, Neil Gaiman, Shakespeare, I mean, they literally are like, I mean, I there's a book, where there are literally no punctuation marks in it, an entire book. And it's a, it's, it's a bestseller, like, you know, and, and yeah, that's exactly. probably something that people would be like, you, you should never write a book with no periods or commas or punctuation <laughs> marks ever. Very interesting. But there is one that exists in this world. <laughs> it's very you know? interesting. What is that book called? I don't remember. It's been a long time. It's been probably 15 years since I read it. So, you know, not to age myself or anything. Maybe, maybe, maybe longer. <laughs> I, I think it was, I don't, I don't want to misspeak. I have a feeling I know what it is. Like the, the title's on the tip of my tongue, but it might be wrong. And I'm on a live stream on the internet that's forever. And I don't, I don't want to say the wrong title. <laughs> people who read it know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, hi, Bonnie, by the way. Hi, Bonnie. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what book is that? I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up because I, I do not want to misspeak. Um, I don't want to misspeak. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably for the best. Because I, I just have a feeling. I just have a feeling that I am going to misspeak. That happens to the rest of us. Um, Sam just popped on. Hi, Sam. Hi, Welcome Sam. To the live stream. Sam. 
So what we got going? Are you looking that up right now? I was, but now I'm now I'm not because it's taking too long. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna need to tell them the title, and I have a feeling I know what it is. But if I say the wrong title and it's a different author's book, they're gonna crucify me. Um, it's entirely yeah. possible. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Um, yay, caught this live. Yes, you did. Yay. We're so excited to have you here. But my son's trying to crash our live stream. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I hear my husband in the hallway like, I know you want mama, but you can't see mama right now. <laughs> That's so cute. Oh. Cute, cute. So yeah, so that's, I don't like any advice. And I normally tell people actually to stay away from advice that says always or never, especially newer writers. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think when you're a newer writer and you don't have like confidence yet in your work or you're still learning your craft and like it's mm -hmm. maybe your first book that you're writing and you don't really know what you're doing and you're just kind of towing in the water. Um, it's really yeah. easy to get overwhelmed with always and never advice and then to get really discouraged too, mm -hmm. thinking like, Oh, but I do this sometimes, so I'm not a good writer. That mm -hmm. is not the case. Exclusive mm -hmm. language, I think, is could be really harmful to newer writers. So, um, so I definitely agree that we should try not to use that language when giving writing advice, if at all possible. Mm -hmm. Especially as like, you know, content creators here, where this is sort of like the free and all, you know, mm -hmm. access to the internet, you know, author tubers. Um, so yeah. I just yeah, yeah. Well, it will also overcompensates. It also yeah. overcompensates. So when I was learning sign language, they said this sign means this English word, and it is a one-to-one -one correlation, and that's how we memorized it. And so they said, Oh, that's how you memorize it, that's how you learn it. But then you get into interpreting, and they're like, That's not even the case at all. This could be 10 different English yeah. words, or yeah. this English word can be 10 different signs, and you're like, wait a second, what happened to my one-to-one -one <laughs> correlation that you taught me in 101 class? And so yeah. not only does it make people discouraged and feel like they're not a good writer or whatever, it also causes this this over almost overcorrection where once you're on the other side of it, you have to like unlearn it yeah. and then figure out how to rebalance it all back out. Yeah, so and I think, I, a lot, I think actually a lot of the advice that we're we've been talking about during the series incorporates language that is kind of always or never as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think there's a couple of of other pieces of advice we're going to try to get through today that is sort of a classic example of that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, speaking of, that was a not so <laughs> subtle segue into <laughs> it was perfect, <laughs> and your little chin thing worked too. <laughs> I, I don't know, know why I do like that. This. I think it's because I'm like, I think it's mysterious or something. I don't know. I don't know what that you is. Need I do, you need to do stuff. your your thumbnail from when one of your videos. Like, would you do this? Or would you do this? <laughs> and you have to be your thumbnail for whatever video you have. I swear. There are so many, from my YouTube channel, there are so many things that I never thought people would, like, pick up one from watching my videos and, like, like comment about or whatever. And they have, like my rainbow shrimp wine glass, like people, I'll be drinking from a wine glass, like a regular wine glass. And they're like, where's your rainbow shrimp wine glass? And I'm like, <laughs> I need to wash it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just like, oh no, you got to drink out of that one. Cause that's the so famous good. one on your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, it's so it's so funny. <laughs> okay, what is our, our next one? <laughs> our next one <laughs> is, Prologues are bad. Yeah, you hear this a lot. I feel like from literary agents. Um, yeah, and there's a real reason why they say this. Yeah, and they can be bad. <laughs> they can be really bad. Yeah. So we should maybe talk about you know, why a prologue would be used or why it would be good because yeah. prologues can be extremely helpful. Yeah, um, I think actually another Christopher Paolini book um, where I think a prologue was used really well. And I actually tend to err on the side of if you can do without the prologue, then do without it. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, put us right into the action. Like that's where I tend to immediately go mm -hmm. is like, you know, um, unless this prologue is absolutely necessary, cut it <laughs> kind of thing. But 
there are instances like with Aragon, uh, you know, Christopher Palimi's Aragon, where there was this action scene, the prologue um, basically was, uh, this girl was like getting ambushed and all this other stuff. And then it's like cut to, here's our hero Aragon in the woods. And he's yeah, like hunting yeah. and he's like just doing yeah, a thing yeah. or whatever. But that was done so well. And it was necessary to understand like the importance of the events that happen immediately in that first chapter. Mm -hmm. That I thought that it was really well balanced. And with the exclusion of that, it wouldn't have been as strong of a beginning, you know? Yeah. So I definitely think that prologues have a place in yeah. fiction, but that they also can be omitted probably I'm going to say like seven times out of 10. Yeah. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. And prologues, people with prologues have a tendency to <laughs> use tropes and to start where everybody else has started. And that's when they really get bad or when they don't directly tie into the plot. It doesn't immediately like it, th there's no either immediate jump or it doesn't set you up for something. The thing is to use them intentionally. So I just attended a workshop this week with um, a, a best-selling author who also is an award-winning author and she um, her name's Tori Eldridge I believe and she said you know talking about thrillers she said a great prologue might be starting with the actual murder where you are inside the head of the murder victim or inside the head of the killer and then you jump to the detective in their everyday life so it's very similar to what you said about Aragon and that doesn't just set up the story set up the tone of the story but it also sets up immediately tension like a lot of tension in that yeah. moment and so and mm -hmm. i mean you either finish with the killing or you don't you know however whatever kind of story you're doing are they saving the person or, or is the person already dead but either way that's a an example of a fantastic prologue um yeah. i had a prologue though that i thought i needed in my work in progress and i was pretty sure and there was no way to fit it and then I realized um, that I actually could work it into my book. Yeah. And I stuck it in weird places and I chopped it and made it its own chapters throughout the book instead of making it a prologue. Yeah. And it actually fit it right in with the book. And so there are things that you can um, do. Yeah, another thing that I think that, that uh, people tend to do when they have prologues that aren't necessarily adding to their narrative is they're using the prologue in instead of using um, exposition carefully throughout the narrative, and they're using it as like backstory and stuff. So you have context for what happens in the book. Like that will drag down you, what you want immediately from the first page, whether it's a prologue page or page one of chapter one in a book is you want to set the stakes. You want to get the reader invested. You want to build tension and you want to keep them engaged enough to continue with the book. So if a prologue's not doing that, and it's a lot of like backstory and exposition that you kind of dumped at the beginning, which a lot of fantasy writers tend to do this, um, then it's kind of like, you know, it really needs to be a lot of action in those first pages, and not a lot of exposition and talking and stuff. Like we need to get readers like invested immediately, like from line one, from page one. So I think that's a lot of where a lot of the prologues are bad sort of narrative comes in, but like, Six of Crows, okay? One of my favorite books of all time because my husband knows if I ever left him for a fictional character, it would be Kaz Brecker. <laughs> <laughs> like one of my favorite books of all time. The very first chapter is from not any of the characters in the book. It's from this guy who ends up like dying in chapter one and it's his perspective and it gives context for like the entire, like the duologies, like, um, main conflict, but they do it through like direct action of like what this character is doing, you know, and just beautifully done, beautifully done. And so definitely prologues can be great as we've seen in fiction, but they just need to be done intentionally and they need yeah. action stakes. You know, the characters need to be like dropped right in. You know, we need to know motivations. We need to know like what the conflict is, but mm -hmm. there's definitely a lot of times where prologues can just be omitted too yeah so I think yeah the word of the day has to be intentional lauren i think you said it. i think the word is intentional use these things with intention yeah so yeah um we have a few more comments yeah so bonnie he said so relatable about my my child trying to you know <laughs> be on the live stream with me um yes 
Can't pick up on the visual things. Hey, Eva is here. Hi, Eva. Thank hey, you for joining us. the live stream. Yeah, I'll say hi to everybody. Kelly says, I think prologues are important if backstory is important to understand the story context that doesn't fit exactly in the story itself. See, I think that's probably where you and I would disagree respectfully is just that I think that there's always a place where you can put in the exposition and the world building and the other stuff. Like, I think that's where the creativity of building the narrative is. You know, if you have to put a lot of backstory right at the beginning, it drags down that pace right from page one where you want the readers to be like, oh, what's happening? Oh, I'm invested. Oh, what's happening next? Like, you know, you want to keep them turning pages. You know, um, he's really good at info dumping. Um, he, he's kind of, he doesn't do a prologue with it, but he like does chunks of info dumping throughout and it doesn't bog the story down is uh, Brandon Sanderson. So yeah. if you're looking to, for an example of, how you could actually work that prologue in successfully and and not feel like you are limited to just a few words here and there. He would yeah. be an author I would recommend looking at how he did it because essentially you could take his world building pieces out and make an entire prologue out of them because he does he does info dump but he does it in a way that doesn't bother readers, which is very interesting. Yeah. Um, Eva says those that say not to use prologues often say they don't read them. So if they are well written or not, doesn't seem to be a real factor for them. That is also a thing. Like your prologue also, because some people will not read them. Mm -hmm. So your story has to stand without the prologue. The prologue just needs to add context and like an, an additional layer because that's a real thing, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and I think I'm, I would be more inclined to put one in my book because I do read them and I do like them though. So I think the reverse is also true. Yeah, yeah. I just think like, your story should stand alone, like from the prologue, even yeah, if the prologue absolutely. adds to everything. Absolutely. But it definitely should like stand on its own sort of absolutely. thing. I love prologues, but I never noticed them as a reader until I popped into writing communities. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm like 50, 50. If they're done well, I'm all about them. Just like with six of crows, but like they're not done well. I'm like, me. A lot of different ways four pages of my life like stop it stop it, stop it. <laughs> nothing wrong with a well done prologue absolutely right yes uh kelly says i'm not sure if this is the book she was talking about uh, but pickle for the knowing ones or plain truth in a homespun dress by lord timothy dexter doesn't have punctuation that might be it that might be it i have to look at the cover it has been a long time a long time but i remember i read it and it was so jarring because there was no punctuation but i was like this is kind of cool <laughs> yeah that's very my life i will search for this chris is here hi chris what's hi, up chris. My friend from across the home. that was a terrible accent don't judge me <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll judge you for other things, Lauren. <laughs> I got a lot you can judge me on. Just please not that. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Leave that one. Leave that one. <laughs> Let me have it. <laughs> Eva says, I have a series I'm writing for a younger audience. Each book will tackle a concluding ghost story with an overarching paranormal plot that continues through the series. Each book is, uh, each book is planned with a prologue that can be skipped or used as a reader magnet. Great, great marketing tool. A really great use of prologue. The prologue is from the ghost's perspective and involves them prior to their ghosthood. That's great. That's pretty cool. Um, death, pretty I guess, cool. is the right word there, LOL. No, no, that's, I think that's exactly what we're talking about is that's a very intentional, smart yes. use of prologue, you know, as a tool in your kit as a writer. Whereas, you know, other stories may not benefit from them. That sounds like a really appropriate use. And I know, I know. <laughs> Y'all, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, story time. I um, I got drunk online. I went shopping on Amazon and, and ordered some stuff and I didn't know what I ordered. And so the other night when I was on Savvy's live stream, I had just like gotten an Amazon package and I was like, what is this? And my husband was like, oh no, something that you ordered off of Amazon. And I was like, cool, I got a present for myself. <laughs> and, I was like, I have no idea what this is. I can't remember. 
<laughs> and I opened it up and it was a crown. I bought myself a crown and I wore it the entire live stream and I felt so good about myself. Now Where is here. that? I need that in this live stream. <laughs> My friend was like, my friend was like, you're not gonna wear your crown on your live stream, and I was like, I wore it for my last live stream. I feel like it's just a little too much. Nope. Do you remember? In, um, did you watch Big Bang Theory where where Sheldon is apologizing to his girlfriend and he buys her jewelry, and she's like, you think you can buy me with jewelry? And then she opens it and it's a tiara, and she's like, oh. <laughs> look, I'm considering buying another one now. That is the thing you need in your life. So, <laughs> the question of what is wrong with Lauren, it's a list. There's a list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a list. I'll start There's making a list. if you want bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, too many things to mention. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is agreeing that that does sound awesome as far as your prologues, Eva. Um, if the market is trending, it can only help me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> that was a not so great segue into let's go to our <laughs> next. <laughs> our next bit of writing advice. Now that we have discussed how prologues can be helpful. <clears throat> serious, serious face. What about serious face? What's this next one? Don't use tropes. Oh, well, so there's that. So you this is a good example of when not to use always and never language, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Um, whenever you give advice, like never use tropes or always use tropes. It sort of um, gives people the impression that they're either doing things right or doing things wrong. Um, but tropes are a good thing. Tropes can be a good thing. Yep. Overused tropes <clears throat> can be you know, something that readers get fatigued of, especially in a certain genre. Um, mm -hmm. I personally like to use tropes because I like to subvert them throughout the series of, of, of books because mm -hmm. I think that that's really fun. Readers have a certain expectation with tropes and then you're like, wait a second, this isn't what I thought it was. And so I really mm -hmm. like using tropes in the way that I like to subvert them throughout the novel. But there is also such a thing as reader expectation. So if you're writing in a certain genre and you don't have certain tropes, for example, romance, and you don't have a happily ever after or a happily for now at the end of the book, readers can get pretty upset by that because they've come to yeah, accept that from the genre. So, go ahead. Um, so you totally stole the, stole the wind out of my sails. <laughs> Thanks for that word. <laughs> So my guilty pleasure is using tropes. I love to use tropes because I love to twist the heck out of them. They're so fun to twist. Um, so tropes are appropriate if you have something that's unique with how you're portraying it. Um, so I am writing a story about a dragon and most of the things about my dragon are trophy. They're pretty standard. I mean, she's of Celtic descent. She's a golden dragon. So she's got the long braided blondish hair. Um, so it's it's pretty standard, but everything else about her and about the story is totally an upset on traditional tropes. Um, she, it's a cross between an urban and a traditional fantasy and um, the character, there are POC characters and it's this this fun modern society. And so there's, and yeah, there's some fun things, but I love twisting tropes. And yeah. it's fun for people to see something that they've loved for a long time, but kind of gotten sick of, and they see it in a whole new twisted way is right. super fun for long-term fans and can rope in uh, newer readers too. Yeah. Um, I will also say that there's a group that um, I'm a part of on Facebook and a lot of what they do is like uh, self-published and indie authors. It's kind of show giving them business advice and stuff like that. And a lot of the marketing tools that they use is like right to market using tropes, um, you know, rapid release strategies, the rule of seven, advertising stuff. Like they go through a lot of that. And so one of the biggest things that they say is like right to market, which means write the tropes that are selling in the market that you're um, publishing in. 
And that can be actually pretty useful business advice if you think about it. Again, there is a thing called reader expectation. Now it's really great. I love, again, subverting tropes, um, but there is also something to be said for if you're writing in a certain genre and there are some readers who are just like, some readerships that are literally just, they're so gung ho and they will read they will read 50 books in a week or whatever in a month and mm -hmm. you know, they will consume a lot of stuff and they like reading, not necessarily the same plot every time, but they like reading about the same things like romance people that I have, vampire, urban fantasy, Huge dystopian one. readers, dystopian readers are like, I want I to read dystopia, like, you I know. I need some dystopian, yes. Right. So, you know, there is such a thing as reader expectation. And while, yes, we're writing the books from, you know, of our hearts to put out because we love what we do, we're also writing them for other people as well. And we need to kind of be aware of that back and forth a little bit, to a certain extent mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, we're reading it because we know that there's people out there who will enjoy this type of mm -hmm. content. You know? It's gotta um, be a combination. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. balanced all about balance. Like, I feel like I'm a broken record, but it's literally all about balance. So mm -hmm. while probably using the same trope or writing basically a fan fiction of a popular novel set in a different world with different characters, probably not a good idea, you know, because everyone's already read that story and, you know, reader fatigue is a thing. Using tropes to subvert them, you know, um, using tropes so that you can make sure that your readers are satisfied with the outcome of the book and the time that they've invested into it um, and the money that they've invested into it, those are good things as well. So there's a back and forth. And I just don't think this advice is very good because it uses that always or never language that's really like exclusive and um, can be harmful, yeah. I think, to fewer writers. I think it so, is really harmful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see what we got um, in the comments before mm -hmm. moving on. We got a lot yeah. of comments. I know, I love it. I love it when y'all talk. You guys are awesome. <laughs> and she's posing again. Everybody doesn't know. Hello, well, when I started writing Sweet Romance, the advice was to use trope, especially in marketing. See, like there are certain genres of fiction where it's just, you know, you really need to do that. Yeah, but so then you use romance, you risk becoming Hallmark. Don't become Hallmark. Yeah. Hallmark. Uh, now says, can we please stop using the kill, cure the disabled trope, especially in YA? Thank you. And then there are harmful tropes. So there's definitely mm -hmm. harmful tropes as yeah. well you know yeah. so yeah. so there's a good and a bad to tropes here mm -hmm. like there, it's a very complex issue <laughs> yes the uh sam says tropes can be great when it's not the same thing every time tropes are what helps give some bones to the story that's also mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. and then sam says yes twisting them is so much fun i don't yeah. think i like anything more than subverting tropes Honestly, it's one of my favorite things. I love it. I know, isn't it fun? Yeah. Chris says, I feel like the most of the advice you get is exactly that kind of always or never advice. On writing is overrated and adverbs have their place. We'll discuss in a minute. Thanks for jumping ahead there. <laughs> On writing is overrated. Eva says, my fantasy whip on the furthest back burner has, the bl has a blind character who becomes blind as a consequence of a flower that also aided in fertility. She knew the risks of her choice is the defining element of her relevance to the story. Ah, huh. absolutely. Cool. That is really interesting. Sam says, I also didn't like on writing. <laughs> this has turned into how much we all hate on writing. <laughs> uh, that is so far my only active inclusion of a disability that is obvious to others. Oh, okay, so that was from the previous comment. Mm -hmm. Fully anticipate asking you to beta when it comes time. Aw, I love it. I will. I know you wouldn't do such a thing. I see in every other popular YA out there um, <laughs> to the point where she doesn't want to read YA anymore. Heather oh, is yeah. here. Hi, Heather. Hi, Heather. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for joining us. I love you. Own Thanks. the trope you use. Oh, that's so much better advice. I feel like instead yeah. of don't use tropes, we should just say own your trope. Oh, yes. no. that yes. mic drop. Mic drop. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so now to Chris's comment, which is a nice segue to our next bit of advice that we're going to be talking about. Take out all adverbs. 
<laughs> I'm going to let you start. <laughs> um, don't take out all <laughs> I don't think this needs like a huge long conversation because there's a reason adverbs exist. And I think newer writers go crazy with their adverbs because in schools, kids are taught to use what's called juicy words. Um, they're, they're getting used to using adverbs and they're getting used to using the juicy words, which is the words um, that are more specific in meaning. Um, so they're not using all the adverbs. And so they, they sort of, how do I explain? Hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. But um, we, we're sort of doing the thing where we're unlearning the thing that we learned and then we're unlearning it a second time. And so it's just, it's just adverbs aren't bad, but go back to being intentional. Yeah, this is another classic example of writing advice given with always or never like exclusive yeah. language, right? Like never use adverb. That's again, a lot of the writing advice out there falls under the umbrella of that first topic. Mm -hmm. Whenever you use exclusive language in your writing advice, it turns into something that is a classic overcorrection or is way too vague and it can mislead newer writers. Um, adverbs definitely have a place in the English language. They definitely do. Yes, do people use them too often sometimes? Sure. I mean, but I use filler words too often sometimes too. Like that's just part of the editing process and tightening up your prose, learning when it's necessary and when it's not, using dynamic word choices, for example, in like cover copies. You want to use adverbs, but you want to use them selectively and intentionally so that you're like, making sure that readers are really invested in what's going on in a certain moment. Um, but adverbs have a place in the English language for a reason. Like, you know, if you wrote something without any adverbs, it would be very direct, very to the point, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it leaves a lot of room for desired rhythm and flow with your style and your diction and the voice of your piece. You know, I mean, you need to use adverbs in your narration. Um, in your narrative just so that you can really just like make something all its own something that's yours you know the way that you use language in your writing is really important so I think that this is another classic example of just like always or never language yeah. that yeah. excludes sort of that middle ground where it's about balance you know and it's about yeah. intention it's about making sure that you know the things that you're writing you're doing it in a way that's yours, not anybody else's. Like there is no formula to good writing. And that's what a lot of this advice sort of hints at, that there are like rules and things mm -hmm. that you have to follow to be a good writer or to be successful. But that's not true. Like mm -hmm. good writing is writing how you write and being happy with that and like growing in your craft and making something that you're proud of, you know, um, or at least in my opinion. That's what it is. Well, you know, George R. R. could not write stylistically more different than J.R. Tolkien. And <laughs> they are in the same genre. They have very similar styles with the the creatures and the things that like there's so many things that are similar between them, but their writing styles are so completely contrastingly right. different that it's crazy. Um, I think that with this one, I think the intent behind it is um if there is a word that is more precise, um, then you use that word. You don't use all of these descriptions up to a more bland word. Just use the word that means precisely what you're trying to say. And exactly. kind of all of that filler that leads up to it, it's not helpful. So right. when you, and that's, when that's you again. get it, it needs to be intentional. Yeah. So, but this is, this is touted a lot as writing advice. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a second, because we're talking about two different processes. We're talking about the creative act of drafting and writing a novel. And this is the advice given for that part. But then there's a whole different part, which is technical, which is the editing of your novel. Those are two different sides of your brain. Creating and refining are two different, totally different things. So if we're talking about refining your novel and we're talking about editing your novel, then, you know, the advice to say, like, you know, Make sure you're not overusing your pro, your adverbs. I was going to say pronouns. Your adverbs. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> thing, wrong. <laughs> pronouns too. I've been struggling with editing because of pronoun confusion in my novels. Probably where that came from. But 
anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Let me not out myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we're saying, hey, when you're editing, make sure that, you know, you're not overusing adverbs in your prose and clunking it up and that you're you're getting your prose really tight um, and, you know, really polished. That's an editing thing. That's not a drafting thing. Draft your book, write your book, however the heck you want to, with as many adverbs as you want, as long as you get it written. Because you can't edit a blank page. You can edit a bad one. You can't edit a blank one. So okay, if there are 27 okay. adverbs in a, Lauren, a line, go for it. Lauren, stop calling me out on a live stream, please. <laughs> Did I at you? Um, what? Nothing? No. <laughs> Um, I, my inner critic is so loud. Like, I, and this, what you're saying is so on point because this is, it is more of an editing thing than a writing thing. But I think that as writers, we take this as a craft thing. We take this as when I am creating my piece, I need to be this. It needs to be ready. It needs to have all the intensity I want it to have. It needs to have all the flowery language I wanted to have. It needs to be as precise as I want it. Like, I think that we, I, I the, do, can't turn that critic off. And yeah, I think one of the number one traps do that. that people think I have writer's block. They don't have writer's block. They have editing block because they're trying to edit while they write. They don't have writer's block. I love it's, you. I'm I'm gonna, gonna, you watch this. It's when you, it's when you get over this fear of writing something that is not, perfect the first time you get over that fear and you're like i just need to get this out and then i'm gonna destroy it with my red pen later like mm -hmm. that's literally i did not write for four years of my life because i was like I'm, I'm blocked i can't write i can't write no i kept trying to edit what i was writing while i was writing it like mm -hmm. of course not you can't do that drafting and editing are two different processes in your brain you have to be able to do one you know just do the one so that you can refine it with the other one later, you know? Um, and so that's definitely, definitely why I think this advice occurs. But I may have, I may have caused some drama in the chat because I see a lot of comments. I'm <laughs> just wondering if they're mad at me now. Cause I'm no, not no, no. like everybody. <laughs> looks like these are largely just positive comments. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed the memoir section of on writing. I haven't ever read a craft book outside of required reading of which that was one. So I did order romancing the beat is a really good one. You're going to enjoy that one. I don't know that one. Super, it's mostly just romance stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Use of tropes is a huge subject. Yes. Hi, the dogling writer. Thank you for joining us on my rant Thank today. You. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> tropes as a marketing tool to categorize the book is something I don't think indie publishers can avoid. I think that's true to a certain extent. I do. I think because uh, we have, uh, we're limited in a lot of different ways as indie published authors um, when it comes to marketing and promotion, whereas traditional publishers are not. And so to find our audience, we have to be able to say, these are the things in my book that I think appeal to you and use that in marketing and promotion. I can talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's actually a very true statement. I think that's uh, really don't true. cling to adverbs while editing, write adverbs as they flow while you write. Thank you. Yes, that's what I ran. Who are you, Ava? Eva, you need to be on this live stream with us. I know. She's like rocking it here. Adverbs are a valid part of our grammatical system. Maybe aim for cutting a percentage of them as you edit rather than all of them. Yeah, again, I think write your book however you want to write your book and then edit it. Edit it. Edit it. Edit it. Edit mm -hmm. it. 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 Oh, yeah. edit, edit, edit. <laughs> I hate saying it. I hate saying it because my accent. <laughs> it starts to come out, and and it's like it, I can't, I can't, I can't enunciate it. I can't. My mouth doesn't work. <laughs> That's okay. Stumble over it. We got you. You know what I meant. Moving on. We still love you. <laughs> they also add opportunity for prosy description. Yep. Mm. Yep. Which you want to make sure you're not like venturing into purple prose territory, which is why I think a lot of people like adverbs get a bad rap for that yeah. <laughs> um mm -hmm. looking at a book and thinking man this uses the main character's name a lot yeah that's what i'm avoiding right now when i'm going through my edits for my uh my upcoming novel in july is 
I'm realizing there's a lot of pronoun confusion and names and he's and she's and they's and I don't know. Yeah, so that's what I'm struggling with currently. My inner critique is loud and always on, even in drafting. I think yes, that's, that's yeah. true for a lot of people, actually. Yes, me, you and me, girlfriend. Yes. Amy, yes, this. Mm -hmm. I got you. <laughs> I agree with you so hard, as they say. <laughs> I love the, as they say. <laughs> I agree with you so hard, as they say. Yeah, it definitely adds something. <laughs> I love that so much. Just so you know, you're failing if you never finish a draft. You're not failing if you finish an ish draft. That's absolutely, absolutely 100% correct. Anything to get it all out. <laughs> you're just not done yet. You're all so mad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just saw the chat like going off. I wasn't reading comments and I was like, we're having like, too much fun on this live. <laughs> yes, I'm not even gonna read this comment. You have <laughs> my my co-author and friend Abby we literally laugh about this all the time. Because like at a certain point in the night, whenever my, my tongue starts to get tired from talking or whatever, I start to sound like Sean Connery <laughs> because I start like, like words just start to just sort of blend together in a very Sean Connery-esque way. And <laughs> this right here, I cannot say it. Was in theater for my what? entire life. My mother taught literally communication and how to enunciate the ends of your words and I cannot say it. Why have you never recorded yourself sounding like Sean Connery? <laughs> You're wearing your tiara. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I, I mean your crown. It. Excuse me, your crown. <laughs> I can't. Uh, do it. Do it. Oh look at you. That's almost like like a tiara. Look at you. She's got a little head thing going. Oh and it's wrapped in your braid. That's super cute. Super cute. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> it is. <laughs> my editor makes fun of me. She's been my editor forever for my pronoun issues in my book. It's a running joke with us, but it's so, I, you know, whenever you get to the point where you're really refining and polishing your manuscript and you're realizing that you use like one word about 400,000 times and you're like, how did I not realize that I, this is a crutch word for me? Like this is not a crutch word in my last book. Why is yes. it a crutch word now? And yes. That or pronoun confusion or I'm really bad about the word had. I hate the word had. I use it so much. And it's this filler word that in every book that I write when I'm going through and I'm um, editing. Oh, look at you. That was good. Um, when I'm doing that thing that I do. Um, <laughs> It's what like, and I'm like, I'm like, there's about 4,000 uses of this word where it was absolutely not necessary in the sentence at all. <laughs> I could just delete it and the sentence was fine. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I just stumbled upon the stream, but yes, I was stuck thinking I had writer's block and it was totally because I was in my editing brain. A thousand percent agree. Yes. 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 I am convinced that writer's block does not exist, but editing block does. I said that, um, Deidre, I'm right with you on this. I, I just, my editor or my, my, my inner critique turns on and it is just so loud. It drowns out the creative process. And until Lauren said that, I thought I had, I thought I had writer's block. Mm -hmm. Yep. Genius. Took years to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Years of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts so good. <laughs> um, for real, still edit editing it will heal the feel of too many adverbs to hear pronunciation she's trying really hard <laughs> to mess me up she, she is born to get you <laughs> i stumble with the eel ill sounds mm. the problem with the southern accent is that the words start to blur if you one don't have enough coffee two have too much coffee three get excited mad tired etc I've never read a more truthful comment on the planet. You know what? If I don't at some point, if I don't at some point receive a, receive a video from you 
uh, speaking like Sean Connery. Um, <laughs> I discontinue our friendship. <laughs> I need it. It's like the 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 SHs start to, you I know, how it's like Sean Connery. It's like the sh yeah. You mm -hmm. just start to like they just start to blur together whenever mm -hmm. you're just like tired. <laughs> in my life. I don't want it. I need it. I need it. Uh, not only does the inner critique scream at me, if people read and assure me, they somehow make it worse. If they hate on it, also worse. There's no winning. Mm. Because, because people who maybe are not writers or critique partners or in the industry, they don't know how to give you constructive criticism that you can use um, in a way that you can actually apply it to your work to feel Build good on it. It's, mm -hmm. it's literally just their opinion a lot of times. So this is something that I struggle with. I ask my husband to read my work a lot and I'm like, what did you think? And he's like, I liked it. And that's not enough for me. I'm like, mm, and then I start to so get it because it's not an actual like editorial assessment of the work, like listing the strengths and weaknesses to where you can apply that, that advice or that opinion to your work. So you, you second guess oh. and you know why you do that because you're you love your work you're perfectionist and you're definitely not an imposter because um only people who are not imposters get imposter syndrome oh just so you know I that's take thing. that and run with it too yeah so that's another thing is that imposter syndrome it's a very real feeling but another thing that helped me with my imposter syndrome was realizing all of the feelings that I had of being an imposter, this isn't good enough, I need to do it again, you know, I'm not writing my best self, all of this stuff, all of those those thoughts and feelings and everything that I had um, about being an imposter was because I was trying to make my book the best that it can be, and imposters don't do that. Oh, no, they the imposters don't. don't do that. No, they think they no. already have. Right. Hey, I love you. I, lo I needed this live stream this weekend. I don't know anybody else that is feeling this way, but I have had um, imposter syndrome so hard this week. It's just been, I, I had to stop writing and I've been trying to fast track this novel. And so it was really painful to me, but for me to just be like, I have to walk away. I have to walk away for a minute because it's not, it's not, something's not working. It's not working. It's not good. It's um, that, 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 that. Yeah. Yeah. I need it. Um, do you want me to try and say that word again? Make you feel better. <laughs> Amen. As a southern gal, the accent just takes over. Yes, it does. Lord Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I had this one recurring client who has an issue with the word past. She would use past instead all of the time. It became such a running joke. Yeah, all of the really good editors, they're 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 like, hey, you realize that you've used this word like eighty seven thousand times, right? And you're like, oh my god, now I will never, never unsee that. <laughs> or <laughs> <I know that. laughs> um, oh, Pettit editors are angels. I love y'all. I thought it was good. I liked it. The bane of a writer's existence. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It really is. <laughs> you can overcome imposter syndrome if you find the root of that imposter feeling. Yeah, yeah, a lot. A lot of times, I think whenever you're starting to feel imposter syndrome, the best advice that I have for people is to step away from the project and get a little bit of distance. Um, because then, it, it, when you're right up on something and you feel like there are a lot of flaws, it's really hard to get out of that sort of cycle of thoughts and everything to be able to make progress. So if you take a break, you take a step back when you're starting to feel overwhelmed, you know, maybe you work on another project, maybe you work on research or something else, and then you come back to it a few days later or whatever. It's like you can look at it more objectively and you can say, okay, this is what I need to do. And you can move forward. So that's a good indicator of you need to take a, a healthy step back, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's, that's actually advice for people with writer's block too, is because, um, um what dal is saying um i'm sorry you can overcome imposter syndrome if you find the root oh yeah because usually i find that when i feel like i have imposter syndrome not imposter syndrome excuse me um writer's block it's because there there literally is something wrong with the story or there's something wrong internally so yeah. i'm having an internal that's sorry i'm signing to you guys like you know what this means <laughs> um there, 
I love this side. This is like internal like angst and and just bad stuff, feelings, bad feelings. Um. Anyway, so there's either something internally happening with me where I'm feeling imposter syndrome or um, there's something wrong with the story where I'm recognizing subconsciously that there's a plot hole, but I'm not recognizing it as I'm writing, but my brain sort of goes and pulls the brakes. And so I have found if I like, if I back away um, and I just give myself like a day or something and I'm just thinking through, I'm like, oh, oh, oh yeah. And I have that like, oh, my, my, car there's this big plot hole or my characters yeah. are doing this. Or I forgot to mention this. I wrote this. No wonder. And then it's like you're on fire. You're like, I know what I need to do now. I got this. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's another reason that I say the the part one stream we tackled um, right every day. And I said that was really unhealthy, that you need to be able to distance yourself from your work and take breaks. Another reason that I'm a big proponent of that is because of all of these other things that writers always complain about. It's like these are indications you need to take a break. You need to step mm -hmm. away for a minute. It doesn't mean stop working because you can always be working towards learning your craft, marketing, development, query list. You can always be doing something to be productive, but sometimes mm -hmm. you need to take a break from the work itself so yeah. that you can be better, you know, so that you can be better so that mm -hmm. your work can be better. <laughs> <laughs> if you follow that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm reading it and not disliking it is fun, but when they got what they got to know is I want to talk about it all day if you liked it or if you didn't like it enough, and I need to know why. LOL. Yes. It's like, yes. You know, I need to know every detail of every thought that ever passed in your head as the word slipped through your brain. Yes. Thank you. Talk as you read, people. Thank you. <laughs> yes. This too shall pass, she said in the past, as she passed the scrapbook that held her past. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Did I get all those right? <laughs> but I hate that sentence so much. <laughs> I'm loving this stream. This is so good. Oh, my God. I love you so much right now. Yes, I so needed that. Imposter syndrome hits hard sometimes, especially when yeah. you see flaws and other praise it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Deidre, I love you so much. Thank yes, I'm so glad you're joining us. This is him. Uh, we are having entirely too much fun. And then the editor in the group says, yes, you did get it correct. That's it. <laughs> I actually beta read a book recently and found myself getting editor's block as I was writing feedback, questioning every phrase I used. Yeah, seriously, there's no such thing as writer's block. It's editor's block. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Editing is mentally taxing for me. The ba that balance of honest feedback and empathetic discourse. Mm -hmm. I hate drafting and I love editing. So I will like draft. I will draft my book and I'll be like, oh yeah, here's all the, the flowery phrases and the characters and the tropes and all the wonderful things and I'm done. Okay, because I want to get it over with. And then I put it away for a while and then I pick it up to edit and I'm like, mwah. <laughs> 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 I am the meanest to myself when I am editing. Oh my gosh. See some of the comments I have put on my own manuscript. My co-author has in the chapter that I wrote of our book. And she was like, Lauren, you've got to stop cussing at yourself in this document. Like, <laughs> this could not be healthy. It makes you <laughs> makes feel so good, though. <laughs> it's like the evil little part of me. I don't know. I love it when I know the client and I speak the same language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My imposter syndrome is mostly because I don't have a degree in writing. English is my second language and I'm blind. So typos. I feel inadequate if I'm not prepared. I mean, that's that's valid. It's valid that you have those fears going into it. Knowing that you have, you know, um, those fears is something that once you know what it is, now you know how to overcome it. Right. So you don't have a degree in writing. A lot of writers and authors don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. I went to school for theater. You know, like, yeah. I didn't go for creative writing. You know, you don't. You don't have to have a degree in something to be good at it. I mean, Mozart <laughs> learned by doing. That's what a lot of people. Yeah, do. A lot of people. Um, English being your second language, I can see that being a barrier, but you know, and your visual impairment, I can understand that, you know, before you send a manuscript off, you might want to have somebody like Heather or me or somebody who 
does editing and English is our first language, just to, like go through and help you clean up your stuff, you know, and suggest mm -hmm. that's where connections and, you know, just saying, mm -hmm. okay, I know that this might be a barrier for me. So once I'm done with this, let me get some outside help. Like that's all about delegation and stuff too. You know, knowing your limits and knowing how to overcome them. That's a really powerful thing. You know, mm -hmm. I have limits. I have tons of limits. I have time limits. I have a lot of limits when it comes to my writing, with my editing, with everything. And I never let any of that stop me. I was like, oh, okay, I'm not good at this. So I'm gonna learn everything I can about it until I'm an expert. Dal, you have us and we love you. And, and we love you and I'll do anything for you. Yeah, we, we you have a community behind you, friend. Yeah. <laughs> Utilize it. Make note to record reaction video while reading Lords. Oh God, don't do that. <laughs> oh my God. Do that. I take back everything I said. <laughs> I will never watch anything ever again except for it. I will no longer eat or sleep. It will not be good. Please don't. <laughs> oh God. Oh. It can be mentally taxing for sure. I try to balance that as well. Lauren to herself. Bless your heart. <laughs> Yes, the worst curse in the southern part of the United States. Bless your heart. If you hear this other woman say, bless your heart, she has already decided she's going to kill you and dispose of your body. <laughs> the threat it's not good. is it's not good. a nice thing to say. It is a threat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having too much fun today. It's a little awkward when you say the other woman has already figured out how to dispose of your body. When you say bless your heart to yourself, I'm just pointing that out. Look, I said what I said. <laughs> I read more than wrote in my courses. The writing courses were motivation to finish things, but offered no memorable lessons. And that's another thing too, is people oh, think that wow. having a higher education um, in a certain field means that you're an expert in your field. And that can be the case. It can, or it could mean, you know, uh, many different things that you're just prepared in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, it's always good to have a degree, but it's not necessary, especially in the creative sphere to be a master at your craft. It's just not. So there's that. I like that, yeah. I'll record my reading, read it out loud where my husband listens without reading it before the allowed reading, re Lauren's reaction video. Oh God, oh God. It's turning up fast. <laughs> I write last. <laughs> uh, I always laughed in college because the business majors had to write longer papers in those in the literature department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lauren, I'm done. I need to rewatch this. I haven't laughed so hard. <laughs> I, I don't know. There's a list of things that's wrong with me. We discussed this earlier. I don't know if you're in the stream then, but it's long. Oh my God. I sent you an email. I want an email. <laughs> it was really long. I'm sorry. I feel left out. Oh, you are so funny. I want an email too for making a list of people. They want an email. Oh, Lord. Okay, what is our next writing advice? <laughs> are we still doing that? <laughs> I don't think so. I think we're just talking about having a chat. <laughs> oh, God, what is wrong with me? <laughs> it feels like this needed to be like one of those sleepover streams what are those sleepover streams you do yeah <clears throat> that's kind of what this is more like so we have two more pieces of writing advice to get through <laughs> okay serious okay. face come on <clears throat> we could do this game face 
<laughs> Maybe. You gotta edit this and just like edit out all of our weird laughing. <coughs> no, but I might take some of these for blooper, a blooper reel at the end of the year for all my oh, shenanigans. Oh, that <laughs> would be Okay. Right? Like no one is going to read it is our next piece of advice that we are going to tackle. You go first because I'm dying. Okay. Good. Because I actually have an opinion about this. I feel like this ties into what we were saying before about the inner critic and turning it off. And I feel like that's what the intent of this is. Because yeah. I think people are like, oh, people are going to read this and, 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 and it spirals out of control really quickly. And so I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that's um, <clears throat> the intent behind it. However, um, you want to create a piece of work that people actually want to read and you need to both love it, love what you're trying to write yourself, be excited about the plot and the characters and everything, but also have an avatar in your mind. I can read the comments. <laughs> Somebody's saying something. Um, <laughs> You guys, I'm going to make it through this. Hold on. I have to finish this. You have to have an avatar in your mind of the reader, the perfect reader for your book. Okay, tell me what they say. <laughs> it's so stupid. You know when you giggle and then somebody like looks at you and then you giggle again after you've gotten yourself calmed down? Yeah. Just calm it. Game face. <laughs> she says before immediately. <laughs> what are you talking about? I never do. <clears throat> okay, my hot take on this writing advice. I gotta get through it without laughing, you guys. Oh God. <laughs> okay, you know what I need you to do? I need to pose. That will get me. No, that doesn't get up at all. <laughs> I thought it would. <laughs> my pose didn't work. <laughs> okay, so write like no one is going to read it. I agree with what Cammy said that I think that this is about turning off that that inner voice in your head, that inner critic, um, so that you can write. However, it's a classic overcorrection, um, especially because it depends on how you decide that you're going to try and publish. If you are going to be a self-published or an indie published author, even a hybrid published author, then that means that you're going to be involved in a lot of marketing um, in terms of like how to promote and sell your book. So you have to look at your book at a certain point as no longer a creative enterprise. When it gets to a certain stage, it's a product. It's a product that you are selling to your clients, you know, and you're now the CEO of your own small business because you're the author and you're selling it to the public. So write like no one is going to read it sort of negates all of those publishing avenues in terms of advice because what you want to do whenever you are refining a product or sale is that you want to make sure that you're doing it intentionally and that you um <clears throat> and that you are doing it with your audience in mind with your your customer in mind right you know you don't want to write a book refine this book and then it literally only appeals to two people in a genre you know and that's because it was written in a certain way and not in a way that your intended audience is going to be receptive to. So being aware of that, I think, is in the editing part and then in the marketing part, honestly. Shouldn't be in the writing part at all. So I think turning off that inner critic, definitely a good a good bit of advice to this. So it's kind of like 50-50 yeah, yeah. for me. But I also think that, you know, whenever you're writing and you're publishing and, you know, we're being intentional with all of that, you just you want to make sure that you're putting out the very best product possible. And that means knowing who your audience is and knowing how to speak to them and knowing that you're writing for yourself, but also for them. It's a it's a conversation, just like musicians, you know, um, music artists, mm -hmm. the, the really great ones. What they do is they're having a, a dialogue with their audience. They're not just singing these songs for themselves. That's what the showmanship is about in their shows. You know, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what a lot of it is, even though it's very personal to them and it's something that they've created. They've created it for public consumption. They've created it to go out into the world and to have a dialogue with other people. And so that's what you're doing with your book too. So you should be, you know, taking that into consideration as well. But again, this may depend on how you plan to publish. This may depend mm -hmm. on several different things. So I just think this advice is a little mm -hmm. bit like, vague and that's why it's not very good advice not that the advice itself is bad just that it's not specific enough 
and it sort of negates, you know, some other things. I'm trying hard to not laugh again. Okay, no, so I want to add to what you were saying about it not having a place in the writing. <clears throat> I agree with that, but I do want to add. The I drafting, think that, the drafting. Yes, part. excuse me, the drafting. But I do want to say it should, you should consider your audience when you're in the the idea making phase. So whether that's outlining, if you're a heavy outliner, or just coming up with your characters, learn don't read the chat. I'm don't sorry. read the chat. You're going to start laughing again. Um, so if you, if you know, you have to know your genre and you have to know your avatar before you start drafting, essentially. So you do need to consider it before you draft so that as you're drafting, you are writing something that is marketable, that's in a specific space. There's a, there is a literary agent that's been on YouTube for a few years. He's over in England and he did this uh, rejections video. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it, but I loved this rejections video because it's like a five minute video and he rejects like 30 manuscripts in five minutes. It is insane. He's like round file, round file, round file. It's insane. So most of the time what he's saying in that video is I can't sell that. Um, well written, I can't sell it, it's not marketable. Or the book might be well written, but I'm not even gonna get to it because you know the the letter they sent me is awful, garbage, you know. So um, but a lot of the times what he's saying is I can't market this. It, the the word count is way off. The it doesn't fit in any particular genre. It doesn't, it's written about something that no one cares about, like somebody's personal history, but not adding things in. So my point, my point, my point is simply, I know, and I see you and you're dying. My sim my <laughs> point is simply just to remember um, that you need to have an avatar in mind and you need to know that that for marketing purposes, there is, there is a place for that. I know there are caveats and I know that there are um, <clears throat> genre crossovers. I'm a genre crossover, but I'm just saying to know it before you go into the drafting so you can just turn that off during the drafting. So I think that's good advice for somebody who's drafted books before. But I think, again, um, I'm trying to go like 101 with this because writing advice is especially really um, harmful, like what we're looking at for newer writers. And mm -hmm. for me, it's get your book out, write your book, write whatever book you're going to write, write it and then go from there. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason that I say that is just because a lot of newer writers will like hear that, what you just said, and they'll go, I don't know who I want to write my audience for whatever yet. I'm not, you know, I'm not there yet. I just have an idea and I want to get it out. So for me, it's write a zero draft. And then I've had books even where I've written them, the book that I'm publishing in July, when I wrote the zero draft of it, it was like completely different. It was a YA instead of an adult themed book, you know, all of that. I think I was able to fix all of those things like with editing before it ever gets to an agent before it ever gets to anywhere else. You know, because you really need to, the first or zero draft is really just you telling yourself the story, you know, and so you really just need to just get it on paper. And then from there, go, you know, I just told myself this story in YA, but it's really not YA. Let's, let's, in edits, let's fix that, you know, or mm. I just, I just told myself this story in a, you know, fantasy world that I created, but I'm pretty sure it's set in space. So let's fix that. Like, mm. Or vice versa, because Songs of Autumn, actually, when it was originally um, outlined and drafted, was going to be set in space on a space station. And it was not going to be a fantasy novel. And then it became a fantasy novel. So I think this advice and the reason I said that is, you know, write your book, get it on the page, do your zero draft. And then, you know, from there, you can figure out your audience. You can figure out, you know, what it's missing. You can you can do rewrites. Like, you can do a different draft. Um, and so that's why I was like kind of saying like the writing drafting part, like maybe this advice isn't great for, but in edits, mm -hmm. rewrite, you know, marketing, like mm -hmm. it should definitely be applied, you know? Mm -hmm. Or not this, but you know what I meant. Um, in <clears throat> Interesting. So. Yeah. I'm, I, I overstudy and I over prepare. So, but you know, that's the thing too, is uh, while I do plot, um, mm -hmm. I'm more of a planter, you know, because I, I leave room for creative interpretation through my draft um, because I find that like through the process is when I get some of my best ideas. And that's not mm -hmm. how everyone's writing process is. So mm -hmm. that's another thing, too, is like generalized writing advice, like we talked about in part one of the stream series. Like, um, mm -hmm. 
that's really harmful because like you yeah. strive with knowing where you're going and what the plot is and stuff. So mm, I strive, I'm a character, but I have to have an avatar. Right. So, I have to like, know who so, I'm while, so while what I said, like, hey, you know, maybe don't worry about your audience in the first draft, like that would work well for a writer like me. Like it wouldn't maybe for you. And that's yeah. another thing like we've been talking about is mm -hmm. don't generalize writing advice because everyone has a different process and they're yeah. all good. There's no bad writing process you know so agree to disagree respectfully i'm totally okay with that i still <laughs> love you as long as i get my sean connery and and, and your crown i know up. right um mm -hmm. let's look at some of these comments now how dare you enjoy yourself lauren how dare i shame 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 not vogue lmao yeah, is that what my pose is? I just do it all the time. Mm -hmm. My pose. I guess I'm voguing. <laughs> my friend Abby has known me since I was four years old and she's over today. She's my co-author. And she literally just said, you've done that pose ever since I've known you. So apparently I've done it since I was four. <laughs> Not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> okay, the dawdling right. Even if you write it like no one is going to read it and then hide it in the depths of the attic or basement, some relative of yours is going to pick it up and read it after you die. <laughs> so you might as well make it entertaining for that relative and hopefully to the other people who would be willing to pay for the story. Okay. That's okay. Okay. It got a, it got a little dark, but it turned around at the end. <laughs> write first, market later, edit with marketing in mind. I like that. I like that. That's pretty good. She's doing really good with like being succinct with this when we're not. She really is. <laughs> Although the first zero draft shouldn't be read by too many people. Huh. No, no, no. The first draft of songs will not be seen by another human being on the planet ever. It was so, it was the worst thing I've ever written. It was bad. It was bad. I don't know my audience. I know Dow. I try and I try to help you. You're in a niche genre though. And I'm not, I don't have as many resources I think to help you. But if there's anyone in the chat who's willing to reach out to Doll to help her with maybe finding her audience, I suggested that she go uh, through Amazon, different categories and find maybe comp titles and um, see how they're marketing, you know, similar comp titles to her book, how they're marketing and who they're sort of the reviews and stuff are from and the demographics of them. But y'all have any other like advice, more specific advice or resources for Dal with finding her audience? I'm sure she would really appreciate that. Um, and that's yeah. to the, the paranormal writers <laughs> that you just uh, learned about and just kind of ask them if any of them cross genres and which genres they cross. Because you might find a tribe in there. Yeah. Um, Audie wants to know the link to the video of that uh, agent just Reckon people's manuscripts. Oh, that one. Not the, he means that one, and not the um, the first half of our live stream. Well, how about we send them the link both? Yeah, you can watch both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think you should write like no one is going to read it, but edit for your specific reader. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I do. Um, but like I said, everyone has a different process, so it might not work for everybody. But it's what I do, and it seems to work out well for me. But you know, whatever. <laughs> I prefer author tube content that shows the evidence of their own process, the writer's journey. I would have outgrown the advice section a long time ago. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I do tend to see, like, I like to see the process in action. I like the journey to publication videos and stuff a lot more. Um, if it's something really niche, like really specific, like I did one, I think it was one of my first videos and it was like basic budgeting tips for authors or whatever. And it's like literally basic financial advice or whatever, but just, through the lens of like um, like saving for editing costs and stuff like that and like knowing where your money's going and just like basically the lens of like saving for different things as an author. And so that advice video I did, but that was mostly because like that's what I was doing at the time is I was trying to figure out how to finance different things for my book. And I was like, I don't know, maybe other people are doing the same thing. So you guys aren't necessarily talking <laughs> vlogging. You're just talking making videos around what you're doing. Is that what you're yeah. meaning? Yeah, that too. I do. I, I you know, I, the you live go. streams that I do actually tend to have way more views because of my stupid shenanigans than <laughs> my actual like I spend 
like researching and scripting and editing and all this stuff for these my videos and like no one watches them unless I'm drunk and ranting on them. <laughs> No, you know what? I've actually noticed that is a phenomenon on Author2. The live streams are far more attended than yeah. the other videos. I've looked at like multiple channels and I thought that was really interesting. The vlogs and the live streams. Yeah. Tend um, to be a favorite. I can only see so many writing advice videos before you've seen them all. And that's another thing too is like, you know, how many times can you say the same thing? How many times can you see the same thing before it just starts sounding like, you know, an echo chamber? You know, mm. oh, I'd rather react to the first draft, Lord. Literally, no one on the my husband who lives with me, because why wouldn't he? <laughs> um, I don't know. What you're about. He has not seen this first draft. <laughs> bad. It is bad. It needs to burn. It is bad. I I don't know why I've kept it. Actually, need a reader to read it. Maybe my Mister can read it and know some comp style. Yeah. He reads a lot of crossover genres like step and sci-fi. I think he may oh. fall in the market, but I've not read it. Yeah. RK! Hey, friend! How Hi, you? RK! Heck yeah! <laughs> Heck yeah! <laughs> Heckin! Hey, RK! And it was relatable advice. You watched that video? I'm so, I'm so like, oh God. Please don't. Which video? Like, works in finance. Oh, the finance one. I'm like, I don't know. We've talked about too many videos. Oh, my God. I'm so... I'm swimming. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. It's not just sci-fi. It's a mix of paranormal. So eh, I no longer know if people even care, but I care. We care. We care, girl. Care. We love we you. <clears throat> we do. That's the setting kind of, I think, I really think he'd be a potential reader. Oh, Matheson's What Dreams May Come, one of his faves. I loved What Dreams May Come. Mm. I stopped watching advice videos because they gave me anxiety. I would sit down and remind myself of every single one. See, mm. that's exactly what we're talking about. A lot of this advice, always or never exclusive language, especially for newer writers or people who are trying to figure out like how to wade into the waters of writing and publishing and all of that. It can, it can be really detrimental to newer writers because they think, oh, I have to do all of these things or it's not going to be good. And that's not the case because writing is a creative venture. It's unique for everybody. Everybody has a different process. Everyone has a different stylistic voice. And as long as you're just like, you know, growing and learning, you're doing great. <laughs> if you're writing, if you're putting words on the page, you're winning, period. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, this is really fun, but I'm going to have to go. Thanks for the great stream. You're across the pond, so I totally get it. Goodbye, my friend. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. A and yes. <laughs> we would benefit from the normalization of orally posting rough stories to discuss pre-zero drafts as a means of sharing the writing process, putting a pin in just Eva's point. You know, I I think one of the things that I believe that I think is probably the most controversial thing that I've ever said in a writing sphere is that I think that through collaboration um, and themes like intertextuality, collaboration, co-authoring, I think those those aspects of writing, the community aspects of writing and refining, like with other people, help mm -hmm. us to really actually take our craft to the next level. And yep. people are always like you're not scared that somebody's going to steal your idea or whatever. And I'm like, there's no such thing as an original idea. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's no such thing as an original story or trope or storyline or whatever, because they all fall under different things that have already happened because we're all, we're all people. We yeah. all have the same human experience. The only thing that's truly original is the way that you write it, you know, like the mm -hmm. way you put those ideas together, the way that you phrase those words. Like, so it, it's, mm -hmm. You know, I've always I've always liked going to like writers groups and um, helping other people with their stuff and letting them read my stuff and rip it apart. And I don't know, I'm a masochist, whatever. So I do. I wanted to speak to this. So Charles, I actually do two things. I have a Facebook group where um, it's uh, short story and flash fiction critiques, and we put out a prompt and write it, and then we all critique each other's work throughout the week. Um, but then I also I do live stream workshops on my channel. 
uh, once a month where we create a unique prompt and we have a little lesson and then we try and incorporate that lesson, whether that's um, creating characters or prose or whatever, whatever the lesson is. And I usually invite somebody uh, fabulous like Lauren, who knows what they're talking about. And they co-host the, the workshop with me because I believe that one, writing, writing conferences and stuff costs way too much money. And two, I think that um, actually applying the things that you're hearing while you're hearing it is the best way to to actually utilize it. And then the best way to grow is the critique and the discussion afterwards. So, you know, check out what I do on my channel. Like I said, it's it's once a month I do a workshop on specific writing skills. You might like it. Okay, talking about my little piddly. This was like the second video I ever put out on YouTube and I did not know what I was doing and I can't so embarrassed. I want to just, I want it to be buried in the internet, like, so where people don't watch it. I mean, find it <laughs> easy, save and invest early so you're saving compounds. Yes. Yes. When I read aloud indie books, I stop and critique. We openly critique it. That's literally a thing Mr. and I do. Oh, Lord. To be a fly on your wall when my book's being read. <laughs> well, I'll well publish, not just indie. Indie just tends to have some meatier meat. <laughs> Your mom is really original. Oh God, are you watching my video about the acting thing when I was telling the advice from my mom? Is that what you're doing? I feel like he's watching my videos and like commenting on the stream. <laughs> Someone said intertextuality. Yes, I did. Intertextuality is sort of the concept. I'm gonna bastardize this and paraphrase it because my brain's fried, but it's sort of the concept that um, we're all inspired by writers uh, that we've read and um, things that we've read and just other people's works that we enjoy and even the ones that we don't enjoy and that they are, um, they're all a part of the work that we put forward. So nothing is truly original. It's basically a collaboration of all of these things that we've learned and read and loved, you know, and then put out into the world. So yeah, that's that true psychology is something that I definitely, I love. Thank you guys. Hive mind, basically, for books, you know, yeah. I have to go now, but this was fun and very helpful. Thank you for being here. Oh, I, don't. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably in no position to give advice, seeing as I'm still at finding my own foot in publishing. Um, but I would pitch a prequel to alpha beta readers for both Kara and sci-fi to see who gravitates to it more. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like good. I'm just existing. I'm just exist here. We literally have only one more piece of writing advice to get through. And then and then I promise I'll stop with the shenanigans. <laughs> At least on stream. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shenanigans never really stop with me though. So you know. So here is our last piece of writing advice that we are going to be discussing. It is don't use complex words. In your work, I will let Cami. How this is not a thing. Have you ever read a book? This is not a thing. Writers use complex words. This is and what Lauren would say a classic overcorrection. Uh, yeah. Because I already have catch. Okay, I'm going back to Friends. Have you guys ever seen Friends when Joey's trying to write a letter? So that, um, what is it? So somebody can adopt or I don't remember what it is, but he's trying to say that they have big hearts and he's looking up words. Have, Lauren, have you seen this? The Friends show? Yeah. And he's I like, have friends. have over or something like that because he's just the sourcing everything. So this is why this advice exists is because writers can go overboard. And I know I went overboard when I first started writing my first novel, um, which um, is shelved currently. <clears throat> but I started using really big language and I'm like, look at my big words. I'm using big words. And I went crazy with it. And that's not the point of writing a story. You want to write a story that people want to read. And so you don't want to go crazy with it. But that doesn't mean you can't use big words. You should use big words when it's appropriate. Just don't be like, look at me, I'm smart. I use all these big words and they make no sense. So I me. guess I have catchphrases now. But we're going to we're gonna go with, this is a classic overcorrection. And another example of always and never exclusionary language that we should yeah. not use 
when giving writing advice to other people, saying always or never to do something, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I would definitely say using complex words should, I mean, you should, you should use whatever words feel appropriate in your prose, um, especially if there's like a character who is highly intelligent and knows these words and knows what they mean. You should also include context clues so that readers can infer their meaning because mm -hmm. if I have to stop and look up every other word because there's literally no context clues for the words that you're using, yes, that's gonna take me out of reading and enjoying your book. So just like with Shakespeare, here we go again with Shakespeare. I keep talking about him. But he, made up words. he made up words that nobody knew of because they didn't exist in the human language. Mm -hmm. But he used context clues and he used um, iambic pentameter in which the tone and you know cadence in which he wrote so that his audience could clearly infer the meaning of his words throughout all of his written speeches. So they knew what it meant, even if they'd never heard the word before, if that makes sense. So if you're gonna use complex words, you should be making sure that they're used in a way that your reader can understand them. One meme that I love that I've seen probably a million times now is like we should, it, it was basically like a Tumblr post or something that somebody made into a meme and like started posting on Facebook and stuff. And it was like, let's stop this practice of making fun of people who mispronounce words because that means that they read them somewhere and they just don't know how to phonetically say them. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, you know what it means. You're using it in the right context. You just didn't say it correctly. Stop correcting them, you know, and like making them feel embarrassed for that because they read them in a book somewhere, you know. So this is how I feel. I love that. This and is how I feel about vocabulary. I am a huge fan. So I grew up, I grew up in a very small town in very South Louisiana. And like there are more cows than people where I grew up. <laughs> and like I could never find anyone to date growing up, <laughs> like in high school and stuff, because I would use a word like ostracized. Like oh, I felt so ostracized or whatever, right? And they'd be like, what? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't date you. I can't, I can't date you. you. <laughs> You, you can't use context clues to understand what I meant about that in that sentence. Mm. <laughs> no. uh, intelligent? No. Anybody else? Right. That's so, like, I didn't date anybody until, like, pretty much college. <laughs> but more of a bad personal life on the internet now for everyone. To see. <laughs> everyone. Anyway. Um, but also, like, I think using complex words, um, in certain instances can give a real sense of uh, professionalism to your writing, just depending on how it's being used. Again, it depends on the story. It depends on voice. It depends on stylistically. Like if you're in first person perspective, for example, and I have a character that um, I wrote in first person perspective and she can't read. And so like, she's not going to use very large words because she hasn't read them to know them. She's going to use words that she knows like within her own you know, in her monologue, because that's what first person perspective is. But if it's like third person, you know, limited perspective, you could use larger words, especially in the descriptive areas and stuff. I got to use a word, Mercurian, in my second book uh, of the song series. And I'm like obsessed with the fact that I got to use that word. But it's all about being intentional and finding balance and making sure that the voice of your piece is appropriate for the words that you're using, you know, um, that kind of thing. So it's it's literally just like, I feel like I'm just, I have all the, I'm just saying all the same things. Classic overcorrection, be intentional, find balance, make sure that it, it's in line with the voice of what you're writing, but write whatever the hell you want, however you wanna write it. <laughs> like, stop <laughs> telling me I always have to do something or I never can do something, because I, I will break those rules. Ma'am, I fully was thinking you were going to say, I will break you. <laughs> I was like, well, that got escalated. I was <laughs> My lungs are on fire and they're very caffeinated. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fully expected it. Okay. I'm drinking I'm like, oh, no. okay, okay, maybe I just escalated it. <laughs> In my mind. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about the coffee. I'll break you. <laughs> God, I'm a southern 
lady. We don't break people. We guilt you into breaking yourself. We just bless your heart. Exactly. <laughs> guilt you into doing it yourself. <laughs> yeah. I will not mess up my hair for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh god what is this dream turned into <laughs> too much fun yep <clears throat> oh god <laughs> now we've got comments oh lord wait i think this one ah uh, i despise this piece of advice yes Mm -hmm. This is such a weird piece of advice as readers also hate writing that make them feel like the author, like, but I guess that's the source of it all. As readers also hate writing that makes them feel like the author, that they were dumb. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to feel like you're talking down to your audience. It needs to feel appropriate um, whenever you're writing. If the big word is precisely what you want, need, then use big word. It's the same with adverbs. Yes, it's the same with adverbs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Use those. I think in addition to always never being admitted, the word should also be admitted. Um, should, should also be admitted. <laughs> should, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm suffering from, you know, my lungs being burned by cats. <laughs> <So. laughs> um, <clears throat> put it on my tab. <sighs> put it on my bill, send me a bill. <laughs> this example has, I have, you can, could, Etc. better options. Yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Thought, they, missing words, that's why I need an editor, lol. Was it the unfortunate event series that sort of twisted this rule into a win? You know, I don't, I don't think you can really pin it on any one series or any one book. Um, I, yeah, I don't think you can pin it on any one series or book. They were like, oh, she's too smart for me, LOL. Mostly, I was like, wow, you're too dumb for me. I can't hold a conversation with you. Therefore, I am no longer attracted. Goodbye. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. I have very high standards. Oh, she's serious. Yeah, I will break you. Lord of mercy. You do stop giving me advice or I'ma bless your heart. <laughs> yeah. My lungs are on fire. <laughs> I feel like somebody's gonna put that on a t-shirt and I'm gonna see my own quote on a t-shirt somewhere. <laughs> that has happened before. I was in a I was in a, a tweet thread with Jenna Moresi and some other people and I said something funny and somebody made it into a t-shirt and people bought it. I was like, oh God. <laughs> So weird to like run into somebody who has something I said during my shenanigan rant. <laughs> like, uh, oh, Lord, you're you say that? Show it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Like some of the things I said should not be put on t-shirts and worn in public. Okay. <laughs> it should. Yeah. Lol. <laughs> or should could I suppose. <laughs> oh, I'm sweaty now. <laughs> <clears throat> that was uh, that was fun. Eventful. So, you guys, um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we've done all of our writing advice. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the end of We're the stream. Um. And I have not yet switched into Sean Connery speech pattern. So, you know, unfortunately, that will have to wait for an, a later stream. Let us know if you would please be kind enough to share this live stream video with friends who you think might actually get something out of um, the in between the laughter, uh, some of the things we talked about, um, or to like the stream because that helps our, you know, YouTube analytics. Please make sure to check out part one that is on Cammie's channel and her channel. Everything is linked down below. That would be super great. Um, <laughs> and if you want more shenaniganry, feel free to like, you know, like be a subscriber of mine because that happens frequently. <laughs> frequently. That's the thing. Um, 
<laughs> oh wait, oh wait. <laughs> Please tell me you name your chill slash chatting stream shenanigan stream or something of this. <laughs> I should. Yes. I actually don't have like a freestanding uh, stream that I do. Um, just because my husband's a first responder and so he works shift work and I need somebody to make sure that somebody's here to watch the baby whenever I'm on streams and stuff like he's home today. So there's not really any like one day of the week or time that I can consistently say that I'm able to stream. So I haven't been able to do that just yet, but that is a goal of mine in this upcoming year to kind of get like a, I was actually kind of thinking what I should do is like do like a late night stream we call it wine and wine, like wine, the drink and whining. And then we just <laughs> talk about all of the things that frustrated us with our writing for the week. <laughs> crazy. So let me know if y'all would be down for that. <laughs> um, I think you need to include shenanigans in the title, though. I just yeah. I think it's kind of done. I, I'm, yeah. It's done. It's done. It's cool. Shenanigans. Shenanigans. It's, it's one of your sayings that needs I'll to be on a shenanigan stream. stream instead of pop up stream. <laughs> <laughs> because there's only shenanigans on this channel. Because there is there's no useful content. There's just <laughs> being an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, ladies. I need to rewatch because I missed the beginning. Oh, you're so sweet. Oh. This was fun, Eva. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, Lauren's shenanigans coming to a stream near you. <laughs> like on a stream, like on a boat. Come on a boat. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Hide yourself behind your pretty hair. <laughs> that changes them. You look like you have a mustache. A hair stash? That's what I was doing. I was doing my hair mustache. My bad. <laughs> my bad, Phoebe. My bad. <laughs> look, I want to like, I want to, who's watched Bridgerton? Who, 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 right. who has watched Bridgerton? Because first of all, John Rhymes owns my whole ass now. Um, secondly, the, it's like Regency era and the men have like these qu these quaffs of hair mm -hmm. and these like long, very done like sideburns. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I've been asking my husband, I was like, can you please, <laughs> please <laughs> go your sideburns? And he can't because he's a fireman. And apparently they're not allowed to have certain facial hair because it could catch on fire that could be a problem. Save people out of burning buildings, and I'm really upset about it. Anyway, <laughs> my face is on fire. I'm upset that he can't light his face on fire for me. I don't know. <laughs> and it's not true, Mom. Bless his heart. <laughs> okay, I do need to end this stream um, because I do need to. Uh, I'm doing a work day with my co-author. So this has been super fun. Please check out Cammie's channel. Check out my channel. Um, let us know uh, if you would like any more live streams like this, if there are any topics you'd like us to discuss, all that kind of stuff. Um, I am open to collaboration. I'm open to possibly doing a shenanigan stream. Just let me know what you want. I'm here for you. The yeah. end. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to end the stream. Oh, for it was a lot of fun. <laughs> all right, guys. Y'all have a great one. Thank you for joining us on stream.